Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Happy Sunday to you all. Good morning, children. And good morning to uh, our brethren that in tune on our WebEx. Amen. We uh, thank the Lord for the opportunity that he, he gave to each and every one to us today, that we are here to give him praise. Amen. Okay, so our uh, first song for our first presentation, we sing, This is the day. Okay, we need to sing with joy. We, we sing twice. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. For this is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. One more time. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. God is good all the time. This is the day. Our second song in our Sing His Praise, 270, song 270, in the service of the King. We're going to sing verse 1, 2, and 4. And for the fourth verse, we're going to stand up and we're going to ask Sister Debbie to lead us in our opening prayer. Song 270, In the Service of the King. I'm in the service of the King. I have peace and joy and nothing that can bring In the service of the King In the service of the King Every talent I will bring I have peace and joy and blessing In the service of the King I am happy in the service of the King so happy Though a sunshine and a shadow I can bring In the service of the King In the service of the King Every talent I will bring I am facing joy and blessing In the service of the King We all stand be in the service of the king I am so so happy all that I possess to him I gladly bring in the service of the king in the service of the king every talent I will bring I am peace and joy service of the king our heavenly father we praise your holy name today we bless you for bringing us together once again to praise your holy name oh lord accept our thanks and praises 
We praise you because you are a great God. You are a wonderful God. You've been there for us when we need you. Oh Lord, accept our thanks and praises. We praise you because you are a great and wonderful and marvelous God. You change it not, Lord. You are I am that I am. We glorify your name. We bless your holy name. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you, oh God, for all you have been doing for us during the, during the week. Oh Lord, accept our thanks and praises. We are here again. We came together to bless the holy name today. Oh Lord, come down. In your mighty power, come down. Come and bless us. Come and bless us today. Oh, as we will be learning under your feet today, oh Lord Jesus, the person you are going to use, oh Lord, empower him from above, oh Lord. When he will be speaking, we want him to speak your word, and we want to have the heart to receive it. Oh Lord, come and bless us. Pray for every one of us. Pray for the youth. Pray for the kids. Pray for every one of us. And at the end of uh, everything this morning, we want to have cause to glorify your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Debbie. Okay, so for the uh, lesson for today, for the primary pulse, who will help? And your key verse is found on Matthew chapter 22, 39. And for the answer is a willing helper. And the key verse is found on Colossians 3, 23, and for the search is Elisha, and the key verse is found on Ecclesiastes 9, 10. Okay, children, are you ready? All right, okay. Let's start to Jeremiah. The mic is there, Jeremiah. You go on your back and use the mic. Careful the cord. Thank you, David. Because of your name, prefer to watch it. Thank you, dear. Amen. God bless you, Jeremiah, and your sister, Eva. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, verse 39. Amen. God bless you. Okay, so David? The other I find David as a one by self. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. Amen. God bless you, David. Okay, Renee? Thou shalt burst. Thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. Amen. God bless you, Renee. And uh, Sister Adessa. Thou shalt love my neighbor as thyself. Matthew chapter 29, verse 33. Amen. May God bless you. So for those that are not here, but they're in tune on WebEx, so you're going to recite your key verse in your uh, uh, breakout session class. Okay, so for, for the search, it says, Whosoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whether thou goes. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 10. Okay, so we're going to sing our marching song, Come to Sunday School, Come to Sunday School. Come to Sunday School, come to Sunday School, every Sunday morning, come to Sunday School. 
Come to Sunday school, come to Sunday school Every Sunday morning, come to Sunday school Bring your bubbles do, bring your bubbles do Every Sunday morning, bring your bubbles do Bring your bubbles do, bring your bubbles do Every Sunday morning, bring your bubbles do Bring some friends with you Bring some friends with you every Sunday morning. Bring some friends with you. Bring some friends with you. Bring some friends with you every Sunday morning. Bring some friends with you. Good morning, brethren, and welcome to Sunday School. Um, this morning, we'll be learning about Elisha. We'll be learning about Elisha this morning, and our text will be taken from 1 Kings chapter 19, from, verse, from verse 19 to 21. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 to 21. Brother Demi will read that for us. Then the uh, second text is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 42. Sister Efe will read that for us. When you're ready. You can use the mic, please, so everybody can hear you. First King 19, verses 19 to 21. was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th, and Elisha passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me pray, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and I will go follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? 21, and he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Amen. Thank you. Um, the, next text, the next text is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 42. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 37 to 42. 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The next text. No, continue to 42. Thank you. Uh, is that up to 42? 41 and 42 now. He that receiveth a prophet is in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these is reward. A cup of cold water only in the name of the Disciple. Really, I say unto you, he in no wise. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. So this morning we'll be learning about Elisha and how he answered the call of God when Elijah called him. As a pretext to our lesson today, um, 
I'll just take, a little, take it a little bit further back. At a point in time, Elijah challenged the prophet of Baal to a contest on Mount Carmel. And there, he proved that God is, that God is the Lord because fire came down from heaven. Then after this incident, another miracle happened. There, was, there has been no rain for three and a half years. Then that day, he prayed and rain came down. So there are two miracles that happened that day. However, when the things that happened on Mount Carmel were relayed to the queen, Jezebel, she threatened to kill Elijah. Then Elijah fled for his life. While on the way, he got weary and uh, rested under, underneath a tree. Then God sent an angel to provide food for Elijah. The food that he was provided with, the Bible tells us, will sustain him for 40 days. Then after that, God, he met God on the mount. Then after he met God on the mount, there was wind, there was earthquake, there was fire. But God was not in those elements. After that, there was a small, still voice. And God spoke to Elijah. After that, God gave him, God sent him on an errand to anoint three people. The first said he should anoint Azael as king of Syria. He should anoint Jehu as king over Israel. Then he should anoint Elisha to take his place as a, as a prophet. So what we'll be learning about today is Elijah doing that which God has sent him to anoint Elisha as a prophet in his place. So this lesson introduces us to Elisha. And the way he was, he was introduced to us shows he's not a mean man. He's from a wealthy family. Because it was, it was, it was farming, and it was not farming with his bare hands. The Bible tells us that he has meals he uses in his farming. That means he has enough money to buy animals to do the farming for him. And the number of animals he has shows how comfortable he is. He had 24 uh, animals that he was using to farm. So he was doing his farm. Then Elisha came along. That would take us to point one. What did Elijah do when he passed by Elisha? And what was the significance of this? Yes, ma'am, Sister Debbie. Sorry, ma'am, can you move close to the mic so the people at home can hear you? Thank you, ma'am. He cast his mantle upon Elijah. Thank you, ma'am. And what is the significance of this? That is the call of God for him. Thank you, ma'am. That is the call of God. Thank you very much, ma'am. That is, that is the call of God. Me, in my, in my natural state, if somebody is passing by me and just drop his coat on me, I wouldn't see it as a call of God. But Elisha knew that this, this would be a call of God. Because in those days, prophets are revered people. It's not everybody, the prophets, go, go about casting their mantle on. So he knew this was a significant event that has happened, which is God has called him. And today, God still calls people. God is calling me, God is calling you. In what ways do God call people today? Can somebody mention one way by which God can call people today? Yeah, well, Pastor Randy, in what way does God call people today? Well, there's, um, there's uh, you know, many different ways that God calls people today and through... Uh, through the uh, sermon, uh, through prayers, and um, you know when um, and in, in, to call for service, of course, God uses uh, our leaders to you know who are praying for 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 people who will be called. Uh, like in, in the case of Elijah, of course, he'd been praying who is going to to um, uh, to uh, you know to to be next after him uh, when he when he goes and. Uh, because he knew that already, God already revealed that to him. So uh, and that is uh, Elisha in, in that case. So um, uh, God uses uh, our leaders as well to to call 
uh, us to uh, you know to do work in in his uh, uh, service. Yeah. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. So God can call people expressly. He called unto Abraham. He spoke to Abraham. He called him directly. God can use our leaders, as Pastor Andy has said, to call us to his service. Or it might be something a bit more subtle. God can open your own eyes to see a part of his service that needs, um, that needs attention. You don't need to wait for your, for your pastor or leader to call you. Perhaps you, you've come. If you had our own, our own place of worship, you saw that the, the flowers, they are growing wild. You don't need a pastor to call, you, to call you or to tell you to prune it. It's a service for the Lord. God can open your eyes to see what needs to be done in his service. Yes, sir, Brother Abraham. Uh, the God calls us in diverse ways. But there is a first call that God gives to us, which is the call to salvation. Yep. That is the greatest call that God gives to us. Then after salvation, God can then use any means to call us, to get our attention. He can get our attention like he did to Moses. He got his attention through the bonny bush. So as a Christian today, our first call is the salvation of God. Amen. Thank you, sir. And as many as not heeded that uh, call to salvation, may God help them to heed the call this morning. Yeah, Brother Harris, yes, please. So can you come to the mic so people at home can hear you? I remember uh, in Roddington, just a new Christian starting out. Uh, we, that year we had a lot of snow. It was in the wintertime. Uh, this old lady from the church lived by herself. And uh, she had a big living room window. And there was so much snow that she couldn't see out through. So she got down on her knees and she started to pray because she wanted to see outside. And anyway, I was on the way down the road, and it was like something spoke to me. Go in and dig out Aunt Tamer. It was God that spoke to me. Amen. I remember as a young man, I, I just stopped my car, went in, took her shovel, and she looked at her window. And she seen me out there digging so she could see at her window. When Amen. I went in, she said, you know what? She put her arm around me. She said, I prayed for God to send you. I Amen. said, I know. He spoke to me. Amen. Thank you, sir. God still speaks to us today. Yes, yes, my sister Abumi. I'm sorry. I don't want to give our time or repeat what others have said. But as uh, some have been mentioned, God speaks to us in diverse ways. Yes. Uh, God even he uses nature to talk to her heart. Yes. You, you see the sun, you see the moon, you see the rivers, you see the plants, you see everything, you see human. Several times I asked myself, where was I before coming? And so many questions. So God is using this to bring us closer. Amen. He also uses situation to bring our attention to him. Amen. It could be lack, it could be uh, ill health, it could be different situation to call our attention. So we know this, we will try to reach out to him for help. And as Brian Bram said, salvation, Amen. help me. You know there's a bigger being than you there. Amen. And if you move it, so he uses all these ways to draw our attention, to bring us closer, so that he wants to help us to gain our heart for the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, ma'am. And so Elijah was called. When Elijah uh, dropped the mantle on him, he knew it was the call of God. Then he went after Elijah. Point number two, how did Elijah respond when Elisha followed him? What would the natural human reaction be to the response from Elijah? So these are two questions. When Elisha followed Elijah, he asked something of him, and Elijah responded. Who will help us with that? Sister Alice. I'd rather let somebody else take that. Okay. Because it's a little bit confusing to me. I know what the response was, but I don't know why Elijah would not oblige uh, Elisha to say goodbye to his uh, parents. Okay, thank you. Brother Abraham. So when Elisha 
No, sorry, Elijah's response when Elisha responded to fall. Let's remember that what Elijah did, am I getting the name right? Yes. Yeah, Elijah. What, what, what Elijah did was to drop or touch him with his mantle. And that is the mantle which today we can call anything like our jacket, our overcoats. Our coats. Yeah. To touch him. And uh, because Elijah, Elisha is a man of the spirit, not a man of the body. He understood that call. He felt it. And he said, okay, let me go and bid my family farewell. Bye-bye. And uh, including burning his plows, making sacrifice. Then Elijah now said to him, why are you asking me this question? Why trouble thou me? Yeah, what do I have to do with thee? Yeah, what do I have to do with thee? Now, that, part, that particular uh, response is very sensitive for people that has discerning spirit in God. In the sense that Elijah was telling Elisha that I was not the one that called you. This call is from God. So don't think I'm the one calling you. Do what God asks you to do. Have relationship with God and make that decision. And for us today, if we are not careful, when God called us, we'll definitely get an opposition. We'll definitely get some reaction if you are looking for favor from pastor, from your leader. If you think it's human being that has called you, your reaction will be like, uh -uh. what kind of response is, response is that? You feel insulted. You feel humiliated. So that was what happened there. So it shows that Elisha then now knew that it was God that called me. It wasn't Elijah. So it wasn't, it was not looking at Elijah. It was looking at the auto and finisher of the faith. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. He has taken that very well for us. I just want to add a, a, a little bit to it. Because the natural response would be to feel of rejection or being rebuked or rebuffed. But we need to be careful when we have interaction in the house of God. We should not look at the human reaction. When we receive a response from our leaders that is, uh, if I can use the word, sharp, we should not let that deter us from receiving our blessings. We've seen people in the Bible that receive responses that is not what they, what they are looking for. The first example, Anna in the Bible, when the prophet told her, why you are drunk in this early in the morning? She didn't look at, at it that, ah, this is a man of God. Why will he talk to me this way? She pressed on coolly to express herself to the man of God. Also, the woman that was looking for healing for her daughter, Jesus even told that one that the food of the, of the child should not be given to a dog. So we should not let getting a, a sharp response from our leaders deter us from our blessings we've come. We should look unto God. We know what we want from God. We should continually look unto God and he will meet all our needs. Number three, Elisha provide, proved his willingness by his actions. What were these actions? And what does this action tell us we should do today? Sister Becky. Can you come on to the mic, please? Elisha destroyed his business totally. He, the oxen he was using itself, he cut it. He used it to do farewell, uh, goodbye ceremony for all the people. He told his parents farewell as well. The wood he was using for his oxen, he used it to make the... Um, to make the, I don't know how to explain it. To cook. It, to, cook it, to cook with it. So yeah. he had nothing left from his business. From that way, what for us nowadays is that God might have blessed you with a very good business and you are doing very well. You know, you've given testimony that the Lord has increased you. When the Lord calls you, you should be very willing and be very quickly to respond, to say all these things that the Lord has given to me. I will do away with it and follow the Lord. So that is our own. Wow. Amen. Individually. Thank you very much. Yes, Pastor Randy. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, well, these are uh, actually not my personal account, but these are testimonies from uh, people has been called and uh, burning the, uh, the bridges, uh, kind of. Um, um, 
um, a lot of uh, us uh, knows about uh, Reverend uh, uh, Reverend Robert uh, Downey. Um, he's the uh, director of the North American Works, and he's uh, sitting as a uh, one of the board of trustees in, in the Apostolic Work worldwide. Um, he owns a dealership for, of Subaru in, in the States. And when he was called, you just imagine that, he owns a dealership of Subaru. And when he was called to serve God, he dropped everything off and he went and, 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 and became a pastor in, in, in the States. So uh, now he doesn't have the, uh, I don't know if he still owns the Subaru dealership. I, I doubt that because even his children, there are now pastors and ministers too in the church. Another uh, one was uh, a testimony from uh, Reverend uh, Mark uh, Worthington. Uh, he, uh, he pastored in uh, St. Louis uh, in, in Missouri. Well, he, he was a manager in one of the companies, and, but when he was called to, uh, to serve God uh, as a pastor, he went to his boss and said, I'm quitting. And the boss said, H -h -h what can I do to, uh, you know, to persuade you to, to stay? Uh, I, I'm going to pay you more. And he said, no, no sir. You cannot, uh, you don't have enough money to pay for, for, for uh, you cannot replace the retirement uh, that I am going to get by serving God. So Amen. those are the things, you know, it, it is, these are present uh, testimonies of uh, people and that, just like the call that uh, Elisha received uh, from God. Thank you, sir. I hope to today, God is still calling people to service. God even calls people today to leave their homes or to know what they, what they, what they are comfortable with to serve him. God still calls people to go on, on missionary trips for him. God still calls people to go to foreign lands to, to share the word of God with them. May God help us that we will answer the call of God and uh, who, who, as it were, using the word of uh, Pastor Randy, who will burn the bridges that will make us go back from doing uh, the, uh, what God has called us to do. Yes, Brother Abraham. Sorry, I don't want, I, do, I hope I'm, I don't want to no, it's okay, sir. talk too much. Um, I think for us, also we need to look at it in different cadres in terms of how God calls us and the bridges that we need to burn. At the point of hmm. salvation, or before we got saved, we probably have friends that we've associated with for a long time and these friends, we probably need to cut them off. There are some habits. I remember um, one, of our, uh, one of our reverend, he used to be a board of, one of the board of trustees down in Nigeria, Reverend Dilly George. When he got saved, he likes to wear his wedding ring. Not because he wants to show that he's married, but he sees that as a fashion. But when he got saved, when God spoke to him, nobody asked him to drop it. He dropped it himself. I remember uh, bra, uh, there was a brother in Nigeria. I think he's in, he's in Canada now. He loves to drink when it comes to alcohol, cigarettes. He was into different kind of group like cultists. But he, needs, he dropped them. Another one likes to wear tight trousers like he is zagging, but he needs to drop them because he knew those are the things that attract him. So at the point of salvation, there are some things in us that we know that it will turn us back to where we are coming from. Like things that easily uh, beset, beset us. us that we need to drop off. Thank you, sir. Yes, Sister Mary. I hear the call, the call of God even before my salvation. Because before my salvation, God said I should go to apostolic faith. Before my salvation. And I, I wonder that where I'm worshiping, why am I going to do that in that place? So, you know, I obey him. I went there. So it was when I got there that I was saved. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma. Brother Arias. Elijah's uh, willingness to uh, leave everything behind and uh, burn those things, uh, I think, uh, shows that uh, when you burn those things, you don't have something to look back to. Uh, 
It won't cause you any endurance. You know, like uh, Lot's wife, when she was leaving uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they told her not to look back. But when she looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt. So, you know, when you uh, consecrate yourself to God and leave those things behind you, it don't cause you to keep looking back at those things that you have left behind. If there's nothing there for you to look at, then there's no reason for you to turn back and uh, look at the things that you had before. Amen. Thank, thank you, sir. So we've, we've talked about living things to, to answer the call of God. But I'll quickly answer number four, that which we, we, we tells us to, to discuss what Matthew chapter 10, verses 13 to 40 tells us. The summary of that place is, whatever you live for God, God owes no man. Whatever you, you give up, as it were, to follow God and to serve God, God will repay you. Yeah. Both in this world and in the world to come. Because that part tells us that whosoever leaves a, a father or mother or brother or, or sister to serve him, they will be rewarded. And whosoever is so careful of his life, oh, I can't follow God because I want to, I want to save my life. The person will lose his life. But who, who, whosoever is willing to lose his life for the cause of the gospel, God said, he shall be saved. He will find his life. Then serving God might, 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 take, might require us to sacrifice something. We are going to point number five and six now. We talks about, point number five talks about Moses. Then point number six talks about Ruth. Uh, so we'll take these two together. Who is willing to tell us, what did Moses give up to answer the call when God called him? Then what did Ruth give up to follow the God of Naomi? Bradami. Okay, so um, in terms of Moses, he was willing to give up his place in Egypt and um, yeah, what, what did. place did he have in Egypt? So he was he was a part of like the family who was controlling like Pharaoh's family. Yeah, he was he was the prince. He was the yes. prince to the king. So he was the prince in, in the in the palace, in the courts. So he gave that up. Thank you. Then what of Ruth? And Ruth like she went to follow Naomi, her mother in law. So, so thank you. When she was following her mother in law, what, what did she give up? Well, I mean, she gave up her previous life, what she was doing before she went to follow her. Thank you. She gave up her previous life, everything she knew before, where her family is, where her friends are, probably where she had the, something she was doing for livelihood. She gave up everything to follow the God of Naomi, who she, who she must have known is the true God. Because I believe during uh, her marriage to the family of Naomi, she would have known the God they serve. And Moses, he left the comforts of the palace. I'm sure when he was at the palace, he, 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 he didn't have to, to do work, to, to eat. But he left all those to be counted among the children of, of God. Now, my question to you and me this morning is, is there any call of God or call to his service that does not come with sacrificing something? Sister Noma. When you choose to follow God, it says that follow me and take your cross. So uh, all the sacrifices will gonna go along with your service. So uh, that's why you don't, you, you're not supposed to be complaining about all those because this is really what accompanied when you choose to follow God, Amen. to carry his cross. Amen. Thank you, Ma. There is no call that we answer, the call of God that we answer that doesn't, come at, that doesn't cost us something. Let's start from the first call or the great call we take, which is our salvation. Our whole life, as it were, is buried. Because all the friends we used to keep, the evil company we, we kept, the pleasure of sin that we had before, we have to forgo all those. And because of our stand with God, there may be some things that people will deny us just to make us uh, deny God. Those are things we need to bear. Those are sacrifices we need to make. 
Even in the worship of God, this morning we are all here in, in Sunday school. There are other things we gave up to come to service this morning. At the minimum, we could have been in our house sleeping. At the minimum. But God has given us the grace to be here this morning. I know most of us, I doubt anybody here lives uh, from, at a walking distance. Most of us, we've driven some distance to come to, to, to worship. May God help us that what it will take us to serve God and to obey his, his call. May God give us the grace to give it up in Jesus' name. Amen. Then number seven and eight, we take them together. Number seven says, what do you think is most important in the service of the Lord? Let's take that first. What is most important in the service of God? Yes, Sister Alice. I think it's our willingness to serve God without uh, complaint. Amen. Thank you, Ma. It's willingness to serve God. Now, let, let's talk about willingness. There, there was an uh, example that Abraham gave last week. I'll just rephrase it. A father has two sons, and he called them. He told the first, go and do, and do this task. He said, I will go, but he did not go. He told the second one, go and do this task. And he said, I will not go, but went after, after, afterwards. And none of, both of them, they were not willing. The first one was not willing in his action. The second one was not willing in his words. We say the state of mind. For us as Christians, we should be willing to do the will of God. Now, I'll, I'll quickly connect that to number eight, then we'll discuss them together in details. Number eight, we not only need to be willing in our service, but also uncomplaining in an attitude. The children of Israel often complain in the wilderness. What does it mean to be uncomplaining and why is it necessary? So what does it mean to be uncomplaining and why is it necessary? Sister Becky, what does it mean to be uncomplaining? I'll come to you, my sister. Becky. Beyond complaining is to comply and do the work that has been done to you as if it is a duty. Not that when someone says you should do something, you'll do it, but you say, why is it, it is me that is told to do this job? Or you believe that your job that has been assigned to you is less than your skill and ability. But any work that you've been given, you look at it as a privilege to perform it. And you do it with a joyful heart because the Bible says clearly to us that God does not like people that murmur. So Amen. once you've murmured, the blessing is no longer, you would enjoy what God has tried to give, but the blessing is not there because you're unwilling. Amen. Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, Sister Bumi. Uh, it's just like our, uh, okay. So um, we have to go with God without complaining. We have to be willing, submissive totally to him. It's just like our GPS. We don't, I don't know where I'm going, but it's telling me go left, go right. I keep turning. And in a very funny manner, we get to places where we are going. Mm -hmm. God is even bigger than that. So he wants us to trust him. He wants us to have faith in him. The Bible tells us that without faith, uh, we cannot please God. Mm -hmm. He that must come to him must come to him in trust. So it's just like that. It's, God is, he wants that element of faith in us. So... It might even tell us to do this, and it's just like our human mind might be reasoning it out, but we can't figure it out. It's God. He wants us to trust him wholeheartedly. Thank you, Ma. Uh, Brother Harris, I saw your hand. Sorry, sir. Can I come to the mic so people at home can hear you? Thank you. If a person is called to do something, and when you do it, you do it unwillingly, you're in danger of losing the blessing. Amen. So uh, if you do it, do it for the Lord. My, m for me, if I'm not willing to do it and do it for God, 
I'm going to tell the person that I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to do it and feel like it's not. If I'm not doing it for the Lord, I don't feel that I'm going to be blessed for doing it. You have to do it in the right manner. Because if not, it's uh, it's just, how can I say this? Uh, there's no point in doing it if you're going to do it for yourself or just to please that person, to just to be recognized. If you're going to do it, do it for the Lord, and you will be blessed. Amen. Thank you, sir. So for to, to summarize what, what you've heard, when you are doing something, the Bible enjoys that whatsoever we do, we do it as to the Lord. It doesn't even matter if, if you are doing that thing in service of, of your neighbor or you are doing it in service of your brother or sister. Do it as to the Lord because your reward is coming from God. And to, to quickly tie up to this, our willingness is important. So is doing what God has told us to do faithfully. If God has told you, let me use the example of, of the flower I used it earlier. If God has told you, oh, Wale, go and prune the flowers. Do I just get there? Well, God said I should prune the flower. Where, where is the share? I just cut everything flat. Or do I want to do it carefully? Because God has told me to do it. Let, I'm doing this for God. Let me do it carefully. If God has told you to do something, are you doing it half measure? Or are you doing it to the best of your ability that God has given you? If you've done something and you've done it half measure and people can look at it and say, oh, this brother or this sister has done this thing and he has done it wonderfully well and men praise you, but God knows your heart and knows your ability and knows that what you've done, you've not done it to the best of ability he has given you, then the praise of man is nothing because God's reward is not there. God is not pleased in us giving half measures in his service or in anything we do. If you look at it, in, in, the, in the parable of the, of the king that was traveling and gave talents to his servants, when he was rewarding them, he said, well done, thou faithful servant. I told them to come into the joy of their Lord. What he's looking at is not, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's not how big what they were able to get. Because the person that had five got five more. The person that had two got two more. But it's the same response he has given them. That good and faithful servants is looking at our faithfulness. May God help us to be faithful. Because our faithfulness can only be judged by God. Our leaders can see what we've done, but they don't know, they don't know our hearts. They don't know how much talent or how much ability God has deposited in us. His life is between us and God that will do what we are doing faithfully. And when we get to heaven, God will not share reward based on the position you held in this world. It's how faithful you've done what God said you will do that will determine your reward. May God help us to be faithful in his service. Number nine. Point number nine. Sister Alice, can you read for us, please? Um, Isaiah 119. You are closest to the mic. Isaiah 119. Isaiah 119. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Thank you. Please read 20 as well. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Thank you, ma'am. So just take number nine for us because of time. There are rewards connected with the service of the Lord. So what are, so, what are the rewards? So the reward is that you're going to be uh, blessed with uh, you know, physical blessings and eternal blessings. Amen. Thank you, ma. And just, just to be clear, there's reward for doing service for God. But if God has called us to his service and we refuse to use the word of uh, Isaiah 120 and say we rebel to do what God has told us to do, God said we will be devoured. We won't focus on that. We are praying to God that God will give us a willing spirit Amen. and not a rebellious spirit Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Then point number 10. How do our attitude towards God's service affect those around us? 
Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians 3.23. Okay, anybody that's finished, read, please. Colossians 3.23. Sorry, man, can you go to the mic so they can hear from And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as, as to the Lord and not unto men. Amen. Thank you. So how does our attitude, y- yes ma'am, how does our attitude towards God's service affect those around us? I would encourage you, those around us, to do the best thing that they can because the level of excellence you put into the work and your attitude is the way that you can shine the light of God, that there's something different about the way you do the work that you do. So this is external for the people who see us do what we do. Thank you, Ma. Yes, that is. I think our lessons made us to understand that uh, sometimes people around us may see the work that we do, and uh, sometimes they might think we are doing it for God, but uh, God sees our heart, and he knows if we're doing it for the praise of men or for the, to the glory of God. Amen. 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 Before, we, before we, oh, sorry, Brother Abraham. Um, the, what we do for God, sometimes we think people are not seeing us. People can read what we do. And on many occasions, we might be a stumbling block or hindrance to their salvation. Because it's like you, you, someone is asked, like you said, to cut the grass or to trim the flower. And the person did it in a shabby way. The legacy you are putting around people around you is that you can just do anything for God. We won't have a vibrant church. We won't have people that will learn from us. So it will be discouragement. And you see people learning the wrong thing and passing the wrong thing around. So that we cannot maintain the faith that has been handed over to us. Amen. Thank you, sir. In closing, I want, to, I want to share with us, I don't know if everybody read it, um, a story that was narrated in the answer uh, lesson for today. There was a boy, his name was Sebastian, and he had an uncle called Martin. They attended a midweek service. And after the service, of course, people prayed and people were leaving the church. But the uncle called Sebastian that he should come and help in setting up the, the church for the next service. Then Sebastian was like, I have assignments to do, but eventually he agreed to do um, the work. Then the uncle now encouraged him in the Lord and told him that doing work for God should not be seen as if you are doing a chore. It should be a privilege. Because not everybody can do the work of God. God only allows a few who have dedicated themselves to him to be in his service. And the uncle made him to realize that some of the work you do for the Lord, as the one they were doing that evening, they were just arranging the church, every other person has left, that people will not, some people will not see some of the work you've done for God. Doing work for God doesn't mean you need to come and stand behind the pulpit on a Sunday. Some of the work you do for God will not be seen by men. But the more important thing is for God to see what you have done, i.e., that sees what you have done in the secret, he will reward you in public. Then also he encouraged the boy, Sebastian, as we should be encouraged today, that whatsoever we do for God, we should do it wholeheartedly. And he gave him a secret of how he, that's the uncle, has been successful. He said, whatsoever he has to do, he approaches it as if he's doing it for God. And because this thing he's doing for God, he has to do it excellently. It makes it easier on him to do things. No matter how difficult the task is, once he sets his mind that, oh, I'm doing this task for God, it becomes less taxing for him to do that. That might be an approach which we should take when we are doing something. If you have something to do, and it seems to be a difficult task, let's set our mind, as the Bible said, that whatsoever we do, we should do it as to the Lord, and God will help us to do those tasks. 
So whatever God has called you, whatever God has called me, or God has called us as a group to do for him, our prayer is God will give us the grace Amen. to answer his call and do his will. That's our lesson. We'll close with a short prayer. Brother Demi, can you pray for us? In Jesus' name, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for gathering us today, this morning, to speak about the word and to truly um, understand what we were reading today. Uh, thank you for getting us to this location safely. Accept, my, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Um, I pray as we are going along in service that you should continue to keep us and you should continue to help us come to know you more in Jesus' name. I uh, thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.